over the years, uh, Andy has been kind of done to death. I mean, there have been so many different films and books and stories, etc., done about Andy. And we discovered a big hole. And the big hole happened to be no one had taken a look at the silver factory from the point of view of all the people that Andy had brought together, his friends, uh, his assistants, his superstars, etc. So we took a look and we discovered uh, many, many of the original factory people. We did 50 hours of interviews with those people and came up with a, uh, a three-part television series and uh, created a great, terrific uh, book, a 400-page book of uh, comments that uh, Catherine, the director of the film, put together and wrote. Well, in the beginning, um, they were actually rather hard to crack down because uh, being the way they were, they didn't stay in one place very long. <laughs> and uh, tracking them down to these little apartments where they were usually evicted after a while, it, it became very, a very interesting search. But once we got them, um, they, were, they just couldn't have been more lovely. And uh, it was just nice for them to shine and to tell us these amazing stories that uh, a lot of people had never heard before. I always thought Andy's work was very humane, you know, I mean, he's a very human artist, and, he, and he's, he, he's most interested in people. That's good, uh, he, he loved people, there's no question about it, and he was fascinated by people. <laughs> What was it that he had? I mean, what was the magnet that he used to, to pull people in? Because I do believe that he pulled people in. Definitely. Definitely. Let's talk about it. Well, he had this ability that a number of people have of making you, the subject, feel the center of his attention. He had the ability of, of, of giving you his approbation in such a way that by the time you left, you felt like a beautiful person and 10 feet tall. And normally you didn't feel that way, but he could give you that, you know? And in a way that would then make you do things, like work very hard to succeed at whatever it is we're involved in here. He really uh, understood media. He understood what people, you know, icons of media. He was a great fan as a child of movie stars. That translates. But he sees, he sees it in a different way than most of us or any of us saw it. That's what makes it distinguishes him from anybody else. I mean, that's what p distinguishes any artist who's talented that has a vision. They see the world differently. And Andy was born at the right time at the right place, you know, to be this person to guide us into into the, you know, where we are now, where the media is taking over, which you saw, you know, 40 years ago. Um, so I think all that intensity that was going on, fueled by lots of parties, I'm sure there was a lot of amphetamine running around, and people were taking lots, and he never really overdid, I'm sure there was amphetamine, everybody that was, like, you know, legal almost in that sense, people were getting that for losing weight. Um, but I think the craziness also energized everybody, and it was, Andy was a workaholic. You know, in the 50s, he was making a lot of money as a commercial artist. So never underestimate when Andy, Andy was never just like, oh, I'm not doing anything. He was working all the time. Okay, so, so Andy is a little more mature in his aspirations. Like, he, he did go to art school at Carnegie Tech. So he had to study art history and artists and who they are and he knew who they were and what they did and what they were doing and what he wanted to do because it was the type of thing that wells inside of you. Same thing happened with me or in all my, the other factory associates. We were all people who had this 
divine will welling inside of us, driving us, saying, Art, 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 you just have to create, create, create. It doesn't matter what you do, if you paint or dance or make music, use everything. But in New York, in the village, you are free to create. And there was a whole community here, from Alan Capro in the Happenings people, to the Judson Dance Company. Com to the country work for him because he, he realized I had silk screening experience and he needed someone to help him silk screen his painting. And so what started out as a summer job, because I was in college at the time, ended up being the job for about seven years. How did Andy meet you? Uh, we, uh, we met through a mutual friend, a poet named Charles Henry Ford, and Charles knew of my artistic background and my skills in silk screening and so Charles is really the catalyst that brought Andy and myself together. Now I understand that and I see uh, totally from your point of view being a professional, being engaged as a professional, you are on a completely different level than a lot of these let's call them factory people who were for one reason or another, uh, attracted to Andy, and Andy was attracted to them, and he found ways to manipulate them. It seems to me that you, in a way, were also manipulated by Andy. Can you tell me about that? Well, I mean, no. I, I manipulate in the sense that, uh, okay, you can always manipulate somebody by going back on the heel by lying. It's a, but that really is a manipulation. In my head, that's not manipulation. Manipulation may be outsmarting someone, but shaking hands on a deal and turning your back on it is something else. As far as uh, Gerard is concerned, for all I have to say about Gerard, uh, he was the factory. Billy May was not the factory, Andine was not the factory, and Morrissey was certainly not the factory. Gerard was the person who gave the factory its impetus. Gerard was the person who went out, the pretty guy who went out, who, by the way, he was never gay. He was fake gay. I mean, you want to be pseudo gay, you can be pseudo gay, but Gerard was never, never gay. But Gerard was the person who went out to the, the girls' finishing schools of Madison Avenue and brought the girls. And Gerard was the person who went out up to Cornell uh, and brought Mary Warren. To a certain extent, Gerard was the person who was the intermediary between uh, Andy's group of people and the beat, the beat poets. And uh, Billy, when I met him, my idea of Billy was that he had power. It was interesting, I didn't understand it at first, but then later on when I saw him throw Ivy Nichols out, I knew he had power. He had power to throw someone out of the factory, which is amazing because people want to get into the factory, it's the game. Um, when he threw Ivy out, <laughs> he threw Ivy out, you know, and well, the reason why he threw Ivy out is because, you know, she wanted to marry Andy. And um, she's very good looking, you know, this sort of like Egyptian kind of hair and thing. And so she wanted to be close to Andy. And, uh, you know, everybody's like, <gasps> really bored with her. And so she, in order to remain close with Andy, because she knew she was getting thrown out, uh, she took a dump behind the couch so that part of it would remain with Andy. immediately because in those days Andy was very open and so Andy Warhol invited me to come up any time to the factory so I said to Jackie I said what's any time mean what do I do how do I get a pass or you know and she said oh no no you just go so you could in those days you know this is when things were much safer and you just walk in and there'd be people um, Edie Sedgwick and Bridget Berlin and people like that would be there taking pills in various states of undress. At the same time, there'd be like an art critic from Germany there to look at Andy's silk screens and everything. And once again, it would be just this big mixture of total trash off the streets, Hollywood lawn. 
you know, just wearing old curtains she found in a garbage can just wrapped around her. And baby Jane Holzer, who was, we found out later, was this rich, rich lady who dealt in real estate and everything. And of course, Bridget Berlin, we didn't know she was rich. Okay, at the factory, on occasion, the Velvet Underground would come and rehearse, and uh, Nico would be there, and she, would, she was supposed to be the lead singer. Though I always wonder if she was singing or not. You know, the lips were moving, but I was not sure about the sound coming out. But again, you know, that's very Warrolian. I mean, you have a singer that you can barely hear. And of course, in a recording studio, you could amplify it, and you could hear it on, on a recording. But again, that's that twist of Warhol, you know, to tickle people, to provoke people. I mean, if you're a singer, you should belt out, but that was not the case. Well, I think it sounded like, to me anyway, when the money was there, the relationship with Andy was just fine and dandy. But as the money started to dry up, she was starting to stress a bit about the relationship she had with Andy on all of the filmmaking that was going on, and what was she going to get paid to do it? Oh, come on, who told you that? That, 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 and that you could fill in the blank, Edie, the word Edie, with the name of any one of the superstars. That everyone's relation with Andy was stressed because seem from reading the morning papers a uh, number of times it, it was mentioned that you were dealing with the most, you know, Maharaja of, you know, Mogador or the richest, you know, Sheik of Arabia or something. That wasn't true. It was it wasn't even really Anyway, uh, that, finally the bed opened. We're getting there. <laughs> We're getting to the opening of the show. And uh, Andy came, and he was just sitting there, like, staring, and I didn't say very much. And I always had the feeling, because uh, at the time, I was also kind of a writer and a poet and actor, and I had a lot of trouble with acting. I think I was always more of a writer than an actor. So I kind of related to Andy in this non-verbal way. I mean, I, I was not as verbal as I might be today. You know, perhaps today I'm too verbal, I don't know. But anyway, he watched the play, uh, left. He came back several times to see the play. And I don't know whether he was attracted to someone in the play or what. But anyway, he said he wanted to film it. The period was an amazing period. Let's look at it this way. It was the, the, the beginning of the gay revolution, okay? It was the beginning of a lot of uh, very valid social unrest in the United States. Uh, there was a sense of openness that uh, people were starting to feel, especially young people were starting to feel. And it was a very, very expressive period. So people like Andy were motivated to just be creative in a lot of different ways. And part of Andy's creativity, I think one of the things he did better than anyone who has been an artist before and since, is he created this society around him of, of friends, stars, uh, workers, etc. cetera, this, this sort of plastic, group of people who all either loved each other or hated each other, worked together or didn't work together, but it all evolved with Andy. And Andy was sort of like, as again Ultra would say, he was like the conductor of an orchestra. And he was using people the way that he might, might have used paint in a painting, mixing and trying and experimenting to, uh, to move his life along as well as the lives of his friends and his workers. Uh, 
I mean, what, what's the, are you running? Is the camera running? Yeah, because you see, okay, Andy went into cinema. But you see, cinema was uh, very much in the air that already in, in, in New York, in, on, you know, in New York, the, the kind of cinema that one could do by oneself or get with friends or like what, beginning with, uh, with Kesevich's Shadows. Because the screening, the first screening of Kesevich's Shadows at the Paris Theater on 58th Street, it was called Paris, uh, was very, 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 very important. That was in 58. And uh, uh, <coughs> Robert Frank was, he saw it there and met, you know, I saw him there. And Robert, after seeing Shadows, said, oh, yeah, you know, we have to make films. We have to. And then he went and he made Full My Days. And uh, there were uh, others. And then it, like, it began rolling, like getting uh, 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 more and more intense as it went into the 60s. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, Andy, you know, came in during that very exciting period when everybody was talking about, I want to make film. I'm making a film. I'm making, you know. Uh, and then uh, he, he, he got the, uh, he got the, uh, okay, the bug. <laughs> I ran into Andy, and he said, oh, we're making a movie, come on over, come on over, and be in it, be in it. So I went over one day, and first of all, it was windy and cold, and this guy was sitting in a bathing suit. He was, uh, he was sitting in a bathing suit, and they were trying to shoot a scene. No script. Nobody knew what to do. Andy looked like he was lost. He was with the camera and everything, told what to do and everything. And I said, oh, boy, I can't work with these people, you know. There's no script. I never worked without a script. But I've always wanted to do improvisational, and it, ex it excited me, you know, made me start thinking improvisational, but what do I have to say, you know? And I didn't know how to do it, really. Even though I was invited to Second City through a couple of actors that knew me and said, you'd be great in Second City, you know? But I just didn't know how to approach improvisational. So I finally decided one night, Alan Midget, one of the actors with, uh, came over, and he says, Louie, he's shooting a movie right now. Come on. He wants you to come be in the movie. I said, I can't be in the movie. So my next door neighbor came over and she painted a big design on my back for this new restaurant, right? So I went over and then I saw a couple of other people. And that's where I met Candy Darling. She didn't know about Andy, but I was doing a reading. I'm only in half the movie because I had to leave at nine o'clock to go do this reading. So then the, the movie's over and I have to come up to the podium. And uh, first question was, mm -hmm. Mr. Warhol, uh, wh why do you have so much makeup on? And I said, uh, I said, uh, you know, I did, I, I can't remember exactly, but it was like one of those almost no answer uh, things that Andy would do and it just came out and then somebody said, Mr. Warhol, are you homosexual? And I thought to myself, well, if I was speaking for myself and I was homosexual, that would be one thing, but I'm not Andy Warhol and I have never gone to bed with him, so I just, I just without hesitating, really, I said no. And you could hear a pin drop, and nobody could ask a question for a while. It was like very weird because <laughs> it was almost like it's impossible, you know. It's like, why would you look like that if you're not completely gay? Yes, but Andy, see, his technique, what I mean, he taught me, his technique was put the camera on someone, walk away, just say, are you? And, and then they, they have no inhibitions with someone standing and right there. They just like really fight. I mean, I did one movie with Dennis Deegan um, 
like that. I mean, we were tearing at one another, ripping clothing, pulling necklaces, and all he said was, have a fight, and walked away, and then came back, oh, and then he would usually say, oh, that's great, that's so beautiful, oh, it's wonderful, and then walk away again. That was the only thing. I mean, he gave us confidence. And uh, after about a half an hour or something, Andy looked over and he said, and what do you do? And my father beamed proudly and said, I just sprung her from jail. And Andy's eyes grew wide. <laughs> He's just thrilled. He said, no, really, tell me all about it. And, uh, well, you know, anyone, all of a sudden the conversation was fascinating to me because it was all about me. And kids love that, getting all the attention. And so I told him several youth house stories. I told him some war stories about how it was and what we did and, you know, what our routine was like and what the fights were like and what the matrons were like. And he was just enthralled and enchanted. He said, we have to make a movie that we must make a movie of that. And, uh, and, I, and I, they asked him, do you want to make, would you come to the factory and make a movie uh, about your experience about youth house? And I said, oh, sure, I'd love to. When? And he said, well, uh, how about Monday? I said, sure, great. Well, I think they totally influenced everything he did because he was always looking to them for inspiration, for ideas. Uh, literally everyone we interviewed, um, Warhol would say, oh, what should we do? I don't know what to do next. And they would throw things out at him and he would just pick things out of their, out of their heads, basically. And uh, I don't think that any of them ever got the kind of credit they deserved for all the great ideas they gave him, and especially when he started making the films, which I found they were willing to do anything for him. Once upon a time. Once upon a time, it sounds like the present, actually. Not, well, there's no such thing as once upon a time. That's pretty profound. <laughs> Remind me to write that down. There's no such thing as once upon a time. That's my new, latest aphorism. Someone has to remind me, though, because I forget them. I have half-timers. <laughs> a fairy tale by Taylor Mead. <laughs> oh, my God. Now, did someone tear out all these pages, or did I tear them out? They're in order. Oh, the, oh, they're in order? Oh, well, yeah, well, yeah, I have this other stuff here. Once upon... Once upon, once upon a time, the guy sitting on a clock. I don't, I have to color this. I have to do, redo this one. In a large castle. Here we go. In a large castle, with uh, you know, like most castles and cathedrals, penises all over the place, <laughs> while outlawing them. You know. In a large castle, a monster dwell. Andy Warhol. Andy, why is it you're making these films? Um, well, it's just easier to do. It's easier to do than uh, any. Um, well, I, th I think that right, what, what's going on right now, uh, Warhol definitely started the first reality show w uh, way back in the, in the early 60s when he got everyone together and just kept filming them. Um, it, it was uh, remarkable that he managed to get them all together and keep them in, and keep them loyal to him. But once everything fell apart and everyone started backbiting everyone else, uh, I think that there was a lot of a lot of it was almost like what you have now uh, with with Twitter and Facebook and uh, you know people can say things uh, anytime they feel like it. 
and uh, they don't have any backlash. The other point I wanted to make was that we, I think we were both, at least in, in my case, but I'm sure in your case too, that we were both very aware of the fact that we were involved in what I consider to be a very important situation. And you certainly picked up on that when you started, you figured, well, I should be documenting this, I should be photographing it, photographing the factory. And you went headstrong into doing that, and, and that's quite admirable and quite important, especially when you look back at it in retrospect. And then, um, and so in a sense, Billy and I complemented each other in different ways in terms of the archival documentation of that particular scene. I was aware, we were aware at the factory what we were. We could feel the power, we could feel the dynamic of the vitality of the whole thing being the hot spot in Manhattan, uh, the center of the art world, but power that comes with it also. And people say, well, did you know, they asked me, did you know what it would become historically speaking? And I say, no, we didn't think of what it would become historically speaking, I knew it was important. but we knew what it was at the time that it was the premier art spot flashpoint in New York art culture at that time and everything that came with it. We, we consciously knew all that stuff. But I really did. And there was uh, this beautiful blonde girl sitting at a table across from me, beautiful, having dinner with me and as my dinner partner. And I said to Andy after the dinner, I said, who is that beautiful blonde girl? He said, David, don't you know who that was? I said, no. I said, he said, well, we're all going out dancing now, so you, you should really know who that is. I said, well, who is it? He says, this is Brigitte Bardot. A lot of people think he, you know, exploited everybody. But, you know, other people have a different point of view. They, a lot of people think it was a stepping stone. Well, just imagine it this way, and you can think of it from your own point of view. Imagine that you're a young person, and you're coming to New York City, and it's 1964, and all of a sudden you hear about this uh, artist named Andy Warhol who has this factory, and you're invited to go to a party and someone comes up to you and they like you and they think you're terrific and they want you to stay and be part of a movie or come over for whatever in the afternoon and say hello and talk about what you're doing etc cetera, etc cetera. and all of a sudden this sort of snowballs into some sort of feeling of gee I'm really important I'm here in New York City and I'm with this artist and he's becoming more and more famous and he's out every night and they're writing about him in the newspaper and he knows me and he likes me if you have that kind of an experience as a young adult and then all of a sudden uh, it pretty much goes out the window in four years and it never comes back it never ever comes back so you you have to look at yourself and say put myself in that person's shoes, how would I feel about my life today? If you talk to him, well, he never had anything to say. He was a doer, not a speaker. He was the general motors of the art. He never called back some defective motors, though he probably should have. But in art, there's never any mistake, and anything goes.